everyone. My name is Floyd Troughton, and welcome to Better Business with Barnes podcast series. I am a director in our family office at Transactional Service Group. Today, we will address another COVID-19 topic that's been frequently asked. Is this the right time to buy or sell a business? Uh, here to join in the conversation today is my colleague and director in our business valuation services group, Steve Piatek. Steve, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. So I want to kick this off. We're going to try to keep this conversational for everyone. And so, Steve, since you do lots of business valuations, and that's a very core part of uh, your business practice, what have you seen since March of this year when the COVID-19 epidemic really exploded out into the business world? So I would say it's been obviously kind of an interesting time from certain aspects of what our business entails and the types of engagements that we do relative to transactions or acquisitions. We definitely saw a pause in that area. Uh, as we're sitting here today, though, I know I have seen some indications that that's starting to come back uh, with regards to a few of the private equity firms that we deal with. I know that I've seen news releases for approximately four new acquisitions just recently announced. So it seems like that may be ticking back up. Uh, from the standpoint of other types of engagements though, we've seen people, I don't wanna say trying to take advantage of the situation, but either wanting to try to put a pin in the map, if you will, of determining what their business is worth, you know, relative to either pre-pandemic or because of the fallout, or, and as we're trying to, you know, encourage some of our clients to do as well, take advantage if the situation is right in terms of if values have declined to take that as an opportunity to perform perhaps some, you know, estate or succession planning. Now, going forward, again, we're going to try to push that idea onto our clients, especially kind of in the climate of what's happening, as well as the possibility of a new administration that might be incoming in November and changes to the tax law as well as, again, kind of acquisitions starting to pick back up as people become a little bit more optimistic, if you will. And unfortunately, I think we're also gonna see some things in an uptick relative to what we term goodwill impairment testing, where for financial reporting purposes, we're required to kind of take the temperature and assess the value of a company to see if goodwill that they have booked on their you know, financial statements has been impaired and needs to be written down. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to break down a couple of things, Steve, for a little more detail and probably throw a few terms out for our listeners, uh, you know, that they can in reference here. You know, a lot of businesses are measured as a multiple of EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. Today, to your very point, it's really EBITDAC. And we're adding COVID at the end of EBITDA right now as a measuring stick. And with that impact of COVID out there, can you explain a little further about how impairment would hit the earnings, if you will, and what does that mean to a buyer potentially if there is a, an impairment that has to be booked from your world? Well, what we're measuring in terms of the impairment, that would have been recorded when, when the company was actually acquired and again, represents kind of the residual of what the buyer paid for it over and above the tangible assets that were acquired. And basically it represents, you know, all those intangibles that made that business successful and kind of was bred in or baked into what that buyer was willing to, to pay. Um, when we do an impairment test, we compare the value of the enterprise relative to what's termed the carrying value of the assets or, or what they're booked at. Um, when we're determining the value of the enterprise, a function of that is, again, kind of related to the financial benefits or the, or the cash flows or earnings that that business is gonna be earning going forward or into the future. So when those are impacted, that's going to, again, kind of have a deterioration perhaps on the underlying value. The other side of the coin is when we're assessing value, and again, it kind of goes back to 
the underlying value being a function of what somebody's willing to pay in today's dollars for the future benefits, buyers also measure that as a function of risk. Again, because if the cash flows are steady and there's a good chance they're going to realize that, they don't they aren't accepting as much risk, they're willing to pay a little bit more. If there's a lot of risk inherent in the cash flows or the underlying benefits for making that purchase, they're going to want to be compensated for that. So therefore, they're going to require a lower price. So again, given the, the environment that we're in, in terms of what the market's doing, uncertainty relative to what the next few years hold, there's a lot of unknowns that are going to be impacting risk that companies are facing. And therefore, that's going to impact value. So, you know, ultimately, I, I think we're going to be looking at a lot of values for entities that are coming down and and there's really going to have to be kind of some type of measurement relative to whether goodwill has been impacted by that. Okay. Thank you. So in the, as banks go down the road now and banks, like all businesses, have to be comfortable with their risk appetite as well. So with the multiples of EBITDA being driven down for lots of business reasons and whatnot right now. Um, do you foresee banks being more difficult or less difficult? Because there's a lot of money in the system right now to make loans. And any comments that you would have regarding you know, what you see from the banking world? Well, I think everybody is going to be having their, you know, investigator hat on in terms of looking underneath the hood with a lot more scrutiny. Um, so yeah, I, I foresee banks, you know, again, being risk averse, wanting to have all the ducks in a row, if you will. Um, I think what it's going to be coming down to though is whether businesses can kind of tell a good story or kind of support, hey, we've been able to ride this out because of X, Y, and Z. And in the short term, we're going to be able to continue to write it out because of X, Y, Z. And here's our long-term plan. Um, have companies, you know, pivoted for some reason? Have they explored new geographic opportunities? What are they doing to try to mitigate any types of losses? Uh, for, from an operational side, have they attempted to make any, you know, changes re relative to staffing levels or, or you know, eliminating other expenses. So again, I think if a business is in a position to say, hey, we realize this is a difficult circumstance, here's what we're doing or what we foresee as coming down the road the next two to three years, and here's why, you know, I think banks are gonna be a lot more open to that as opposed to, well, we think it's gonna be X and we're just gonna cross our fingers. And along with that, you know, I think people need to be and business owners need to be realistic in what they foresee going forward, because I think they they need to be real in terms of what they may be showing from a projection or, you know, future periods in terms of is if it's going to take two to three years to turn around, you know, bite the bullet and show that it's going to take two to three years to turn around. and or do you need to reduce some types of expenses or take a hard look at kind of what your operations are and if, if there's any type of fat or, or areas that can be cut, if those can be cut, but not to the point where you cut and then you can't manage growth that you want to get after we've kind of turned the corner. So, you know, it's definitely going to be a balancing act for business owners out there. Uh, with that point, I see from my world, um, from the pure buy side, if that's what you're focusing on, a greater requirement to have more equity at the table to make banks comfortable because of the unknowns right now. Where in the past, you, you might have been able to get away with equity of 20 to 25% now into a transaction. I think the banks going to require well north of 25% just so they can get comfortable with where things are at from a business standpoint. And I can also see from, from the transactional side as well, you know, many times we've seen deals put together where there's some type of earnout where you have kind of the sellers with a little skin in the game to kind of try to maintain the business on a going forward basis. So I could see 
you know, different types of contingent consideration becoming a much more prevalent factor in, in transactions in the near future. Okay. Um, I want to talk about multiples for a second, kind of focus back on that, because I think at recently there's been a lot of uh, dry powder with private equity firms and, and strategic buyers out there with lots of cash, not all that many companies to buy, if you will. And the pricing for the buy has become more like an auction. And you're, you know, you're running up the price because there's few uh, good companies out there and many buyers seeking the same good companies. So it ran up the price. I believe that the multiples now, if you were an EBITDA multiple of six to eight, I think that multiple now might be down to five to seven, okay? because of the uncertainty, as you mentioned, Steve, with respect to coronavirus, the uncertainty in how you book stuff going down the road is from a risk factor standpoint. And just real simple things like supply chain, customer purchasing dates, things are getting pushed out, just common sense business stuff is really changing how you have to look at a company from a projection standpoint. Any thoughts on that, Steve? Uh, I couldn't agree more. I absolutely think that, you know, the multiples that we've seen in transactions happen over the past few years are, are definitely going to be something of a, a historical nature, at least in the near term, while people kind of proceed cautiously optimistic, if you will. So again, like you were saying, factoring in these unknowns or, or trying to at least bake in a little bit of a cushion from the standpoint of is the turnaround going to be, you know, a year? Is it going to be five years? I've seen some very pessimistic, you know, projections where people are looking at a seven to 10 year turnaround to get back to where we were just a few years ago. So, you know, I think all buyers are, are kind of taking that into consideration. And yes, some of those very high multiples that were things of the past are going to be more the exception rather than the rule. Uh, great. So one of the things that we're seeing right now from to your point earlier is when people are doing a purchase and there's an earn out component and an earn out for everyone, as we well know, is if you make a certain level of profits or have a certain level of sales, you'll get additional purchase price going down the road. With the unknowns that are out there right now, do you see um, buyers wanting to offer more earnouts to kind of protect their cost to buy, if you will. Um, and do you foresee them doing anything differently on how they measure that earnout? I definitely see earnouts becoming, again, more prevalent in, in many of the transactions that we'll be seeing going forward. Um, I, I think, again, fr from a buyer perspective, it helps to mitigate some of the risk that that is out there in the marketplace currently. You know, whether I think that the earnouts have to be in the right setting and kind of open or available to the sellers in the right setting, if you will. You know, if we're we're talking about an elder owner who is you know just looking at completely retiring. It may not make sense there, but if you've got a you know relatively younger owner still looking to be active, still wants some skin in the game, then, then absolutely. And, and I think from that standpoint, it benefits both buyer and seller, mitigating risk from the buyer side. And you know, if the seller stays on and knocks it out of the park, then that's just you know more that they're putting in their own pocket. Okay. Makes great sense to me then. So if you have a, a client who comes up to you and says, Steve, I want to get ready to get my company to go to market. What are the few things that you might suggest to that business owner, he or she, so that she can get her company ready to go to market? Well, hopefully the client is approaching us with the thought being that there's somewhat of a longer runway to, to have this happen. You know. When we're consulting with clients, oftentimes we get this exact question of, hey, when should I think about starting to look at, at selling my business? 
and we like to tell them, hey, you want to give yourself at least kind of a five, five year, perhaps even up to 10 year kind of runway to really get your ducks in a row and put the best shine on your business so that you can get it ready to get it to what we like to term kind of a best in class approach that would command a premium in the marketplace. We don't want it to be where they're looking for a quick exit and they haven't done anything in terms of trying to, you know, spruce up areas that need to be addressed, uh, you know, or putting their best foot forward. We don't want it to be where it has to happen and therefore there has to be a price concession. Um, it's not dissimilar to trying to sell your house. You, you wouldn't just put it on the market and, you know, not put the best foot forward in terms of presenting it and, and wanting to try to spruce it up to again, kind of command that price. So I think first and foremost, we want people to try to have that longer period in mind when they're looking at selling things. Then I would say, you know, and again, this pandemic is kind of providing that opportunity for people to kind of take a step back and do a self-assessment of, hey, what really makes my business special? Let's take the temperature of it. What is, you know, as we like to term, what's the secret sauce that really differentiates ourselves from our competitors? And whether that be our customer relationships, whether that's our brand, whether it's our intellectual property, you know, really isolate those things, make sure that they're protected. And whether that be having patents on your IP or if you're worried about customers and you have certain key concentrations, getting those locked up under long-term agreements, you know, kind of, again, assessing your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities and threats, and kind of putting a plan into place to try to take advantage of the strengths, shore up the weaknesses, and again, with the ultimate goal of trying to eliminate or at least reduce that risk that a future buyer might be looking at. Um, I think one of the other things as well that somebody is needs to be cogniz cognizant of when they're coming to us is oftentimes they don't even know what their business is worth. And we, we turn this the value gap because whether it be they've worked for so long and there's so much sweat equity involved and it's been their life for 70 hours a week for the past 30 years, or it's the fact that, well, my neighbor down the street, they sold for 25 times EBITDA. Oftentimes, what's actually going to happen out in the marketplace versus what the business owner's expectations are can be vastly different. So we want them to have an idea of what actually they could be getting and whether that's gonna be enough now or when they look to retire. And again, if it's not enough or if it's well below what they thought it was, well, now you have the opportunity again to try to shore up those things that are gonna differentiate you set yourselves and put you in that best class, find the right strategic buyer and get that you know premium paid for it. So you can help them really figure out they can take the temperature or value of the business, if you will. And when you do that, you're using not only your, your knowledge and your expertise, but you're using outside resources as a reference point back and forth on this. Could you kind of give us a little color on that, if you would, Steve? Absolutely. So with basic valuation theory, there, there are certain approaches. More often than not, we're looking at either an income approach or a market approach. So that entails looking at future benefits relative to, again, what you'd refer to earlier as a multiple or kind of a multiplier, if you will, of whatever you're measuring. And so oftentimes we're going to be looking at, you know, certain comparable companies or guideline companies of whether it be individual interests or whether it be full companies from a transactional standpoint that represents, hey, these are the prices that are actually being paid out in the marketplace by real life buyers and sellers. And so we will take those as part of our consideration and what we believe would be a reasonable multiple for the subject that we're evaluating. But because 
the companies that we're looking at aren't necessarily exactly comparable, there are going to be certain elements that we need to adjust or consider or take into account. So as I like to tell people kind of what my area entails, it's somewhat of an art as well as a science in that there's no kind of one black box formula or or one approach that we can apply to everything. And there's going to be a certain level of subjectivity that comes into play when we're evaluating price or value. But that's, again, kind of based upon us evaluating the subject, looking at it from a benchmark standpoint relative to other industry peers, looking at it from a benchmarking perspective of how the company has trended over time, um, and, and kind of saying, yes, we believe that a hypothetical buyer would be willing to pay X, giving this set of circumstances, as well as kind of what the overall market is doing or, or reflecting. I know we're running uh, here kind of down the road. A couple just real quick questions, too. As some of these business owners that own 100% of their company today may want to de-risk or take some portion of their business off the table by selling a piece of it out, can you assist them in establishing the value not only for the whole per company to be purchased, but for a portion of it to be purchased as well? And how might you do that? Absolutely. Um, many of our engagements range from valuing just a certain specific minority or lack of control style level of ownership, such as one share or perhaps 1%, all the way up to valuing a company uh, from a 100% ownership perspective. So oftentimes what we need to do or evaluate is a step when we establish that level or type of ownership that we're evaluating, that influences how we may be looking at the available cash flows or benefits that are earned from that business. And if we're looking at things from the standpoint of it being a non-controlling style ownership, there may be certain inherent items that we have to leave as is or that are unable to be changed from the standpoint of a minority owner that would have an impact on that value, as opposed to if you're in a control position, you can certainly have a much greater influence and control certain things that might also have an impact. Um, so it's one of the things we do consider and we're able to handle, and whether we do that via analyzing the actual benefit stream or applying what's known as a valuation discount relative to a discount for lack of control we certainly can you know handle doing any type of ownership interest that a, a business owner may be looking to gift or sell away okay. so also part of the sales process is to do due diligence you know um, buyers will come in and do you know rigorous due diligence in today's environment, it's a little more difficult to do that. It's hard to physically get to the plants or the uh, companies to walk around and to make that work. Um, some companies do a pre-sale due diligence, get themselves ready for sale, get an outside third party to come in, you know, show where they have great strengths and weaknesses, how their cash flow works, how their adjustments to EBITDA come out over time, because that seems to be a big battleground area between buyer and seller here's my ebitda as stated here's my adjustments to EBITDA. I adjust I'm to EBITDA. The value up substantially higher any comments on that steve i absolutely i i think comparable to what we were discussing earlier relative to uh bank financing that the due diligence process i think is going to be much more scrutinized and kind of critical going forward um, and I, th I think there's going to be a lot more attention to detail paid under the hood by potential buyers, you know, relative to, to the, this app, you know, this type of idea. So this is going to be a good time for business owners to, to really take a look at, hey, do we have bad amounts on the books? Let's get those cleaned up. You know, let, let's put into place, you know, some things that we may have been postponing and and really try to say hey it was this way 
it, or it used to be this way, but now, you know, we're looking at cleaning it up and kind of put your best face forward. And I think one of the other things going forward relative to detail, deals happening it are going to be kind of, you know, reps and warranties that are going to be asked for within purchase agreements or any kind of carve outs that may be sought by either side. So, you know, but from both sides of the table, I think everybody's going to want to pay attention to exactly what's included or not included in those. And, you know, that's what you're going to be paying your lawyers a good amount of money for. With that, Steve, I think we're going to bring our session to an end. Obviously, this is a very wide open session. Steve, thank you for all your guidance and your input uh, today. Um, again, please uh, stay tuned for Better Business with Barnes uh, series coming down the road. We enjoy doing these podcasts. And uh, if you have any podcast requests, please let us know and we can fulfill them for you. Thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate your, your help. Thank you, Floyd. Everyone stay safe out there.